can disc herniations in your low back or your neck heal? Or is a disc herniation a life sentence that guarantees you to have pain forever? Do you need to get surgery for a disc herniation? Or can you do other alternative methods like physical therapy, chiropractic, other types of manual therapy? If you have a disc herniation, what does that mean for you? What should you do about it? Is there anything you should avoid? We'll talk about all of these questions and more in today's episode. Hey, I'm Dr. Anthony Davis with Shapeshift Wellness, and this is the Health or Hoax podcast. The audio format can be found under Health or Hoax, and the video format can be found under the Shapeshift Wellness YouTube channel. Thank you for joining me. What I do is help teach people with chronic pain and recurring injuries how to seize the active life that they love, to reclaim the life they deserve to be living by educating you on things that you can do yourself so that you are empowered to make those changes through exercise, food, sleep, stress management, etc. If you ever want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can have a free discovery call. That's just a, whether you're in person or virtually, and we can just talk a little bit about where you've been, what you're after, what you're trying to accomplish, and get you going on a plan that's going to get you those tools to have lasting recovery. Okay, so do disc herniations heal? Well, let's talk about it. Before we get into the nitty gritty detail about discs and what they are and what they do and blah, 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 the number one rule of back pain or neck pain or any kind of pain is this, don't panic. The first rule of pain and any kind of illness is don't panic. You're gonna be okay. Now let's talk about what a disc herniation is. First of all, there are many different similar conditions where the disc material in the spine has some swelling. So we can have disc bulges, we can have disc herniations, protrusions, sequestrations, and these are essentially different types of swelling on the spine. Now, what I mean by swelling is we basically, the spine is composed of a bunch of blocks, okay? You've just got a bunch of blocks on top of each other. Those are your vertebrae. And when they're stacked on top of each other, in between each of those blocks is a little cushion of cartilage. It's a fibrocartilage disc. And that disc has a tough, fibrous outer ring. And the in inside is a little bit softer and a little bit more malleable. Now, some people will use the analogy that it's like a jelly donut because the disc has a fibrous outside and jelly in the inside. This is a terrible analogy, and it is, I think, only promoted by people who have never dissected a real human body and actually touched a real disc from a real human spine, or they just forgot. They've done it, but they forgot right? Um, or they don't care or they don't, they don't give a shit because they're just trying to use scary language. So some people will say that your spine has these little jelly donut disc shock absorbers in between each level of the spine. And when you bend or twist too much, it's going to squish the jelly out of the backside of the spine. So your jelly squirts at the back, pinches a nerve and causes sh shooting pain down your leg, or if it's in the neck, shooting pain down your arm. Now this could not be further from the truth. The actual materials that the disc is made out of is not at all like a jelly donut. It is mu much more like a car tire filled with chewing gum. So yes, there is a tougher outside material and a less tough, more malleable, uh, viscous material in the inside, but it's more like a car tire filled with chewing gum. And yes, there can be little cracks in the car tire. And yes, the gum can sort of migrate out of the car tire, but it is definitely not anything like jelly donuts squirting out of the back of the disc. So for the sake of today's episode, I'm going to be talking mostly about disc herniations. Um, I think that's more of a common vernacular. Um, people don't really seem to know what a sequestration or a protrusion is. Um, I think a disc bulge is another common term people understand, but I'm just going to say disc herniation, even though most of the time what I really mean is any kind of disc 
swelling of any kind. Okay, it doesn't matter if it's a bulge or herniation or protrusion or sequestration. We're talking about the same stuff in general. Okay, there are a couple of times where I'm going to reference studies that are looking at one specific kind of disc injury, and that's that case. But in general, let's talk about herniations as a broad category of disc swelling. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about discs. Um, People seem to freak out. In clinic, when I have patients that um, I I think they actually do have a disc injury, I, I break the news to them very cautiously, right? I do not want them to freak out. So if I do my tests and I do my exam and I take their health history and I think they have a disc issue of some kind, then I will tell them, okay, so based on my examination, I do think that you may have a bit of swelling of the discs in the spine, but before I go any further, sometimes when people hear the word disc, they get nervous. They get a little bit freaked out. Oh my God, I, I slipped a disc. First of all, discs do not slip. They are way stronger than that. Your body is extremely tough and resilient, so they don't slip because they don't go anywhere. They just swell up a little bit, and that can be very painful, especially if it swells up near a nerve. There are some important things, and I'm, I'm still continuing here as though I'm talking to my patient because this is exactly what I tell my patients when I think that they have a disc issue. Um, so I, I continue with, I, it is important for you to understand that disc issues are very common even in people who have no pain, okay? And... Most disc issues heal. The, the majority of disc issues heal. We do not need to get an MRI, okay? We do not need to get an MRI, at least not right away, because it does not change the treatment. We're going to treat this as though it's a disc issue, and whether it is or it isn't, we don't need to see it because most of them heal, and even if they don't heal, the pain goes away in the vast majority of cases. So you're going to be just fine, but it's probably going to be pretty painful for at least a, another few weeks. Generally, a full resolution for a first-time disc injury is about 6 to 12 uh, weeks. But if it is, uh, you know, especially if we have radiating pain down the arm or radiating shooting pain down the, the leg, it might be more like 6 to 12 weeks months. So it might take time to have a full resolution. You should be out of the weeds sooner than that. Usually people have a period of um, several weeks or even a couple of months where things are very painful. Um, but then things calm down to sort of a low level annoyance type of pain for that longer duration. Now, hopefully with treatment, we can make things feel better faster, but that's usually the course of things. Big picture, you're going to be just fine, but healing might be a little rough at first. So that is verbatim exactly what I tell my patients when I think they have a disc issue. Now, the point there is that I'm trying to not freak them out. I'm trying to reassure them that you're going to be okay. Like you really are going to be okay. Um, these things are common. So that is important to know too, because they, oh, we need to get an MRI. Well, you know, or they want to have an MRI after treatment. Cool. Great, I feel better, but can we go get an MRI and see if, I, if I'm any better? But we don't need to get an MRI. We don't need to see if the disc actually healed or not because even if it does not heal, we see that on an MRI, if you take an MRI of 3,000 people who have zero low back pain or neck pain, you're going to find that most of them, well, it depends on the age, but uh, in general, we're going to see that most of them have some kind of abnormality on an MRI, which makes it normal. It, 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 we say abnormality, but it's actually normal because it's so common. So yeah, I would rather not have a disc herniation than have one, but it's not a life sentence to having pain all the time forever. So now let's talk about do they heal? Well, studies on disc herniations, um, protrusions, sequestrations, what we find is that for herniations, two thirds of disc herniations will heal on their own spontaneously even with zero treatment. So within, um, I believe the study, that study was six months. I think that was six months. Um, but let's say six months to a year. So two thirds of disc herniations will heal on their own within six to 12 months. 
That's amazing. That's fantastic. So you could just wait. If you have a disc issue, you could just wait and see if it heals. Fantastic. Good news. And what's even better is that the worse the disc issue, right? If we see something like a sequestration or protrusion, the worse the disc issue is, the more likely it is to completely heal on its own. Upwards of 98% of more severe disc issues will heal on their own. 98%, 98%. That is really cool. So your body is extremely adaptable, extremely malleable, and quite resilient. So when do we get an MRI? Because sometimes we need to get an MRI. We need to look at it. When do we need to worry about a disc issue? When do we need to be worried? Well, first of all, never. I already fucking told you. First rule, don't panic. Don't panic. The first rule is don't panic. So that was a trick question. Right, right. When do we worry about low back pain? Fucking never. We never worry about it. Okay. But the real question is when do we need to refer you out for more um, intensive medical management and potentially something like surgery? Um, and that is basically if you have red flags. So if, if you have a disc herniation in the low back and you also are getting severe weakness of your foot, that is a red flag because that means that we're getting motor nerve damage, right? We do not want permanent nerve damage. We need to take the compression off of that nerve right away. Even if that, he, that disc was going to heal later on, right now, if that nerve remains compressed for too long, it is going to have permanent nerve damage and you are going to lose um, the ability to contract those muscles. So if you have severe weakness of the foot or toes as a result of a disc issue, and the same thing would go for the hand um, in the case of a cervical or neck uh, disc issue, if you have severe weakness of the hand, then we need to keep an eye on that. And if it gets worse and worse over a period of time, you need to have a surgical consult and an MRI. If, if the weakness in the hand gets better and better as treatment goes along, we don't need to do that. We don't need to get an MRI and I don't need to send you to have a surgical consult. And then the other major, major red flag here is cauda equina syndrome. So if you, cauda equina is compression of the um, nerves in the cauda equina region, the low, low, low lumbar spine, um, where it's actually technically beyond the, the cord, but um, so we the cord then turns into a bunch of nerves that look like horse hair. That's why we call it cauda equina, equina horse, is the tail of the horse. And so so that gets compressed and those nerves control your bowel and your uh, bladder. So if you're having urinary incontinence, if you're having um, bowel or bladder issues, you can't control when you go, um, you know, or if you're having saddle anesthesia, which is imagine where the inner thighs rest over a saddle. If you were to saddle up and ride a horse, well, if that region of the inner groin is becoming numb and tingling, that is a red flag. So if you're having any of those symptoms, basically bowel or bladder incontinence or numbness and tingling along the inner groin, that's saddle anesthesia, that is a red flag, and we need to immediately get an MRI and consult with a surgeon to see if it's necessary to perform surgery. Otherwise, you're going to have permanent issues. Now is a good time to, again, I, I, I'm constantly trying to reassure people because people get nervous about this stuff. It's understandable. We get nervous about our health, but the percentage of people who get cod equina syndrome is remarkably low. It's, it's basically nobody. I've Never seen an actual case of cauda equina syndrome. Um, hopefully, that's because if you're having those symptoms, you have the good sense about you not to call your local chiropractor or physical therapist or massage therapist or acupuncturist. You have the good sense to go straight to the ER and get it taken care of. So hopefully the reason I've never seen one come to my office is because they go to the appropriate place right away. But that's not most people. Most people 
just get some low back pain or they get some neck pain and maybe it shoots down their arm or it shoots down their leg. That kind of stuff is super common. It's very painful and very disabling for a short time, but it is very uh, common and it's going to be okay. You're going to heal. Hey, real quick, um, sometimes these things linger, okay? So I gave you a time frame, a six to 12 weeks, six to 12 months, blah, blah, blah. Well, I've, I've had patients who come in and they, well, I've had this for years and it just keeps going. I just got this sciatica. I just got this sciatica, right? I just got this, you know, neck pain. I just got this neck pain and, oh, it started with, you know, a disc herniation. So they come in and they say, oh, my disc is acting up. Oh, my disc is acting up. Okay. Well, with those patients, they've tried physical therapy. They've tried chiropractic. They've tried other things and they've tried injections and they're even considering surgery. I have helped so many of my patients who are considering surgery and injections to avoid those things, to minimize their pain, to regain the active life they love, to be able to do the things they love to do because I do things differently. I take the time to really understand your needs and health history. We meet for 60 minutes every single time that you meet with me. And I give you a comprehensive graded exercise plan with chat support so you can actually talk to your doctor on a regular basis, and that gets you progressively to the stage that you need to be at so you can reclaim the active life you deserve to be living. If you want to book a free call with me, uh, the discovery call link is in the description, and I really look forward to the chance to work with you. Okay, now let's talk about what to do and what to avoid if you have a disc herniation, a disc bulge, a disc sequestration, um, protrusion. If you have a disc issue, what should you do and what should you avoid? Now, the things that most people think you should avoid are bending, lifting, and twisting, okay? That's the conventional wisdom, but we don't have literature actually supporting that quote unquote, common sense or common wisdom. What we do have is literature showing us that if you avoid doing activity for too long, you are more likely to become disabled by your pain. So as far as things to avoid, what, what <laughs> it sounds funny, but the thing you need to avoid is avoiding things. Don't avoid things. Don't avoid doing your normal activity. Now, I'm not saying ignore the pain and push through it. What I am saying is that if you're having a little bit of pain while you do your activities, it's okay. If you have a moderate to severe amount of pain, then try to modify for a temporary amount of time. So for a short time, modify your activities so that they're less painful do not avoid pain completely. It is not necessary to avoid pain completely. And as long as after you do activities, it's not worse. Your pain is not worse as a result of having done the activity. So that evening or the next day, your pain, your baseline pain is not much worse as a result of doing some bodyweight squats or playing with your kids or throwing the ball for the dog. Um, as long as that didn't make it worse, then the activity level that you tried, that you experimented with, was an acceptable amount of activity. So it is important to slowly ease your way back into activity as you can tolerate doing so. As a general rule, I generally use a pain traffic light to guide this. So these are um, these are actually some, if you're watching the video format of this, I've got these little magnets, these fridge magnets that I give my patients um, when they work with me in person. And it's a little fridge magnet explaining the pain traffic light and the no worse principle. And all that is, is to say, scale of one to 10, how bad does the pain hurt during the activity that you're trying to reincorporate into your life? A one to a three is a green light, a four to a six is a yellow light, and a seven out of 10 is a red light. Green light is safe pain, don't worry about it. Four to a six, yellow light. You can go through a yellow light, but you do not want to race the yellow light. And a red light is too much activity. Let's try to find an easier way to do things. As long as it's not worse after activity. So if it's worse after activity, then you did too much too fast. So 
The point is that um, we try to find activities that are less painful if possible, but we try also to push it. So we're not avoiding pain completely, but we're not ignoring pain completely. We're going to be like Goldilocks and find the middle path and do things, do as much activity as you can tolerate um, that doesn't make it worse and slowly ease back into normal life. Now, as far as specific rehab exercises... Now, there is a lot of conventional wisdom around this, but we don't have a lot of really, really solid evidence to support it, so I want to be transparent about that. Um, in clinic, we usually do try to lean towards some type of McKenzie exercise that is basically finding a directional preference and doing a lot of that movement. For example, if you, if you have low back pain and a disc herniation, bending forward might hurt hurt a lot and it might cause shooting pain down the leg versus doing backwards bends like cobra press-ups or hip uh, standing hip extension exercise if you do a mckenzie extension exercise for the low back and you do it repeatedly and it makes your back feel better and it makes the radiating pain going down the leg feel better then it's a good indication that your body responds well to that direction of movement if on the opposite side, you bend forward and it makes all of those things worse, then we would say that you have a directional preference. Meaning, let's try to do the direction of movement that feels good. Let's do as much of that as possible. And then eventually, you know, keep getting curious about the direction that hurts. And if it hurts to bend forward, you know, try it on a daily basis. Just see how it feels. Test the waters. Get a barometer of how, how your, bend, your forward bending is feeling. And return to, still return to it as, as quickly as you can tolerate. But for a short time, while you're really flared up, we might find that one direction of movement feels really good, one direction of movement feels really bad. So easy, just do the good direction repeatedly until both directions feel good. And the other bit of conventional wisdom, again, we don't have a lot of solid evidence um, and randomized controlled trials to experiment with this kind of thing that really support it. Um, it's not that we have nothing, it's just that we don't have a really strong body of literature on this, is nerve gliding. And that is sciatic nerve gliding, if you have uh, sciatica, and a probably a median, and most people respond well to a median nerve glide for the neck and uh, radiating pain down the arm. So a disc herniation in the cervical spine. So those types of things can be useful um, as treatment, but don't get hung up on it. You know, if you can, if we use the traffic light and you can ease your way back into normal activity, that alone might be enough. Um, as I mentioned, you know, many people, there, there are going to be a small um, percentage of people who will not respond to these simple treatment advice, right? Because most of these things should be self-limiting. They should resolve on their own, even if you had no treatment. So in the meantime, you should try to ease back into normal life as fast as possible, but, you know, not rush it. And for a small subset of people who this does not work for, then they need more specialized care. Those people might need more um, either hands-on treatment, better education, uh, more specific rehab exercises, um, or just more education around the condition and more personal guidance and accountability. Um, as I've mentioned, that's where I come in. Again, not to beat this to death, but if you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can book a free call. We can just chat. There's no obligation. If you don't want to work with me and it's not going to be a good fit, I'll send you in another direction. Um, but that's sometimes the route that you need to go. But the biggest thing to remember if you have a disc herniation anywhere, and if you have any pain or tearing of something in your body or some issue, some chronic issue, um, is don't panic. When patients work with me, I grant them access to all of my educational courses. And part of those courses, the very first chapter in the chronic pain rehab course that I have for my patients, the very first chapter is 100% about how, no, seriously, you do not need to panic. Please take a breath. You do not need to panic. You are absolutely, you are going to be okay. You are going to get through this, I promise you. And I start that way in the course because that's the most powerful message. If you become fearful, kinesiophobic, which is fearful of movement, then you limit your um, movements. You start to shrink your bubble of function and abilities and strength and mobility and all that type of thing. And you get worse, not better. 
So we do not want you to panic because it leads to you getting worse. And we see that fear is actually more disabling than pain itself. Okay. And as a reminder, that means finding the Goldilocks zone, not too little, not too much, just right. If you have questions, leave them in the comments. If you're listening on an audio platform, please leave a review. If you're watching the video, please leave a like and subscribe. Thank you so much for listening. Remember that movement is medicine. Food is medicine. People, places, things, stress management, breathing. It's all medicine. You have the power in your hands, at your fingertips, to change your life radically and transform um, your pain into function. You can reclaim the active life that you deserve to be living. And I hope that this helps. If it does, share it with a friend. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time.